Well, we decided to write this book because um, 2014 is the 50th anniversary of the birthday of EBV, if you like, of the, of the birth date of EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. Um, in 1964, and um, Alan Rickinson and I have worked on the virus really all our all our working lives, um, and so it just seemed like a nice thing to do to document, you know, exactly um, how the whole thing came about. And uh, it, in 1964, and even to some people today, it was really surprising, you know, that a, that a virus might be the cause of a cancer. Um, and within the book, as the story unfolds, it's even more surprising than that this virus seems to be associated with several cancers, not just one, several different types of cancer. And, and so, you know, we just thought that that would make an interesting story. And, and beside that also, the characters in the story are really interesting, we think. I mean, the whole thing started in uh, Africa with uh, a surgeon, a British surgeon called uh, Dennis Burkitt, who went out there and uh, he was just a very amazing person really because he, he was a regular surgeon and he was doing his work in Uganda in Kampala, the hospital there, um, but he had these incredible um, powers of observation and attention to detail and, and it was because of that really that he noticed just this child who came to the hospital with several um, tumours of the jaw, not just one but several, which he, he'd never seen before and he thought was unusual and he made extensive notes on the child and then, you know, he didn't know what it was, was caused by. He quite often seemed to see things like that in Africa at the time. And he put it aside. Uh, but it just so happened that three weeks later, when he was working at another hospital, he saw an exactly similar case in another child. And then he said, you know, this just can't be a coincidence. This must be something. And he just went for it like a dog with a bone until he, he got... You know, he, he worked out that this was a tumour that occurred. It, it was the most common tumour in children in that area of Africa um, and that it seemed to be associated with high rainfall and high temperature. So it was geographically restricted, if you like. And really, that's how the whole story began. He published a paper, uh, Tony Epstein, now Sir Anthony Epstein, saw this paper and he um, got... Well, actually, he heard a talk that Dennis Burkitt gave and he got interested in it. They got together. And out of that came the first human tumour virus. So, uh, you know, that's really the beginning of the story. So to pick up the story, um, uh, Dennis Burkett agreed to send the tumours from Africa to Tony Epstein in London. Um, and this project went for two years with absolutely no results at all. So it couldn't be more depressing, actually, at that point. And for the people in London, uh, it was pretty scary notion because so much was riding on this particular project uh, coming to fruition. The real clincher, the thing that turned it round was a um, day in December 1963 when the 26th biopsy arrived uh, over the two-year period from uh, Kampala, Uganda. This one was delayed because on, the, on, the, on December the 5th 1963 it was very foggy in London. Heathrow was closed. The um, biopsy, the whole package went to Manchester, delayed it by 12 hours or so. It arrived on Friday afternoon and uh, rather than throw it away, they opened the package and thought, well, it looks pretty terrible because the fluid in which the tumour was, was, was being transported was very cloudy as if it had a bacterial infection, we, it could be thrown away. When Tony Epstein looked at it under the microscope, he saw that actually the cloudiness was caused by free tumour cells out there in the fluid. And sure enough, uh, these tumour cells, when they put them uh, into the incubator in the, in, in the laboratory, in the right kind of medium, they began to grow. And so within about six weeks, they had permanently growing tumour cells from this one sample. Uh, no one had grown tumour cells of this kind ever before in the laboratory. They were lymphoid cells, cells of white blood cell origin. Um, and so this, is step, this, this was a step in its own, quite a step in its own right, but um, at some point uh, in February, there were enough cells to make a preparation to look at under the electron microscope. Um, and Tony Epstein tells the story that he looked, he switched on the microscope, looked at the first grid, and there in the first grid under the microscope 
were cells containing virus particles. And they were particles that looked essentially like a herpes virus, the type of viruses that, that cause um, cold sores and shingles, but a, diff a slightly different type of that family. Um, actually, only about 1% of all the cells in the culture contained these virus particles. Um, so he was incredibly lucky even to see it uh, in the first square. He switched the microscope off, walked around the block outside the lab in the snow to cool down because he was so excited, turned on the microscope again and they were still there. He wasn't dreaming. That really was the beginning 50 years ago of, of uh, Epstein-Barr virus research. Uh, it was met with huge skepticism. Uh, A, whether these particles really were viruses at all, because there is always a problem of artifact of false pictures coming up under the electron microscope. Uh, secondly, whether this was a new virus. Thirdly, whether it was a virus that, that um, was there by accident and not in any sense causal. So many of these things had to be resolved before people began to take the story seriously. Um, as it turns out, um, we now know that this was the discovery of the first human tumor virus.